This is Bible Academy. Today we look at Psalm 21. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 21 is a royal psalm. It has to do with the king, but not just anything to do with the king. It has to be something very special. Some of those things, his coronation, his wedding, a military campaign, or something similar. This particular royal psalm has to do with praise for victory over his enemies. The king held a very important role in Israel. Let me bring some points on the board for you. He had to be chosen by God, like David, 2 Samuel 7, 8. Secondly, he had to be anointed by the Lord's prophet. This confirmed his authority and power signified him as the elected individual who was to be king and also was the time the Spirit came upon him. We see that in 1 Samuel 16, 13 through 14. This power enabled him to rule the kingdom. Three, the king was the mediator between God and his people of the nation. As the Lord's appointed ruler over his people, the king made decisions for the holy nation with the goal of keeping, keeping them in line with the covenant. 4. When the king strayed from the Lord in obedience to his covenant, he would not only be disciplined personally, but the nation would often suffer. It depended on what he did and to what extent he did it. This means that every legitimate king was chosen by God. He was anointed. He was provided with God's power. And through the Spirit, he represented God before the people and the people before God. Every king was central to the life of Israel. His obedience to the covenant was essential if the people of Israel were to be blessed and not be disciplined according to the covenant. So this is a psalm about the king. The title A Praise for Victory in Battle. Psalm 21. The superscription reads, we have often seen, for the choir director, a psalm of David. Now I'm going to give you a little different approach on this psalm, at least in the introduction. We understand that it was written by the psalmist. With the name David, we assume it was David. When we read to the psalm, we understand that it was written or authored by the psalmist, in this case David. But when it is read, that is, it's officially uh, proclaimed before the people, there are several people involved. Uh, we're not told which one is speaking. In fact, it might be different people on different occasions. But involved is the king, the priest, the prophet, and the congregation, or the people of Israel. They will say different parts in different lines. Sometimes it's more obvious than it is at other times. 
But this shows us how it was used within the congregation of Israel. All I'm trying to tell you is David wrote it. He may have wrote it from his heart at the time he wrote it. But it was applied or used during their ceremony. Several people could be involved. So they would sing this on those occasions mentioned earlier. Such as a victory in battle, a war's ended, the king's coronation or wedding while recalling the victories through the Lord. Important in all of this is that when they sang this psalm, it reminded the people of the importance of keeping the covenant. The covenant would be kept up in front of them, them being made aware again that they need to keep the covenant to receive the blessing of God, and it was very true of the king also. And this psalm, we will see them recall the past acts of the Lord and their life and nation, then the present activity, and then look forward to his future work and their lives. So we see about the first third of the psalm, or I should say almost first half of the psalm, looking to the past. Then we have one verse, it's a transition verse that looks at the present, and then they look to the future, anticipating blessing from the Lord, uh, not only to the king, but because the king's being blessed, the nation will be blessed. All right, verses 1 through 6. We have 7, and then we have 8 through the last verse here. That's where it's divided up. Now let's talk about 1 through 6 a little bit more before we look at verse 1. Though the psalmist wrote this, and let me just say that it's usually assumed that David wrote it, but other scholarship has begun to learn that, well, maybe it doesn't always mean it was just David. I mean, maybe it's his style. Maybe it's just uh, something they attach to almost all these psalms. But I still hold the view that it was David. So, what I want us to understand is though the psalmist wrote it, there are other people involved in actually saying it during the ceremonies. Now, we would know that's obvious after David had wrote it and moved on or, or died or uh, was involved in something else, and they'd be back using these psalms back in the, the temple worship or the, or the tabernacle worship, actually, when David was alive. But these other people would be involved in giving thanks to the Lord for his strength and deliverance for the king. So they're basically referring to the king and his relationship to the Lord. So this is from the perspective of what has happened in the past, the first six verses. Let's begin. Verse 1. Who's speaking? Perhaps a priest or prophet. O Lord, the king rejoices in your strength you give, and he rejoices greatly in your deliverance. In the Hebrew, the Lord's strength and deliverance come first in each line, emphasizing it is the Lord's strength and deliverance. But we put it, uh, we turn it around, it sounds better and more smooth in English. So we uh, flip it around. But we don't want to miss that it is because of the Lord's strength um, that there is deliverance and victory that results in the king rejoicing. Now let's talk about application as we go through this verse. Some of it's going to be obvious. Uh, we can step into the uh, role as the king as far as applying these things as long as we don't see ourselves as the king and just understand that it applied to him a certain way, but it also can, let me put it this way, it applied to him, but we can make application with the principle in our own lives. I'll point out a number of those. But when you do read the Psalms, keep in mind this background helps you filter out uh, what you don't want to uh, misinterpret. It helps you interpret it properly so you can make the right application. So, uh, let's go to verse 2 where we see the prayer answered. 
You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips, Selah. Selah, again, is that uh, one word that uh, scholarship is not absolutely sure what it means. Some mean, some think it may be an interlude in the music, or there's a change to a higher pitch, perhaps a rest, a pause. Here we see the king is a praying man. He prays his heart's desire, and the Lord grants his request. The Lord does not withhold his prayer request. What a marvelous thing it would be to have a leader of one's nation who is this close to the Lord. Again, remember, this is looking into the past, and the people are being reminded, or I should say, they're being reminded as they hear this psalm that the Lord has answered the king's prayers. Uh, don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. Prayer keeps us aligned with God, helps us stay in His will, and keeps the fellowship close. Certainly, you don't have to be a king to pray or have your prayers answered. But it is a nice thing to live a life where your prayers are regularly answered by the Lord. It was just about two years ago that I heard that my next older brother had cancer. The first report he received was very negative. He had something like five years to live. Of course, this changes everything for the family. He has uh, two children, and, and uh, one of them had their own family. The other one's about to get married. And He's a few years older than I, and this caught everybody by surprise. But then you start to mentally, mentally prepare yourself for this. He's a, he's a Christian, as well as his wife. And as we began to think about this uh, he started his treatment down here in Houston MD Anderson very well known uh, cancer center and just yesterday after almost two years uh, he told me that as far as MD Anderson is concerned he is cancer free now I attribute that of course to the Lord the Lord is always involved in these type of things and lots of prayer and it being the Lord's will, and certainly I'm sure it drew uh, my brother and his family members closer to the Lord and, and a more regular prayer, a more serious prayer as, it, as we expect it would. But then we see these things happen, and that helps us even more learn to trust the Lord and encourages us to pray. I've seen answers to prayer uh, even within the last couple of weeks. And... Uh, as soon as that prayer was answered, within a few days, I'm challenged tremendously in another way, and here we go again. But that's the way the Lord does things in my life sometimes. There's one big challenge and challenge after another. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. Verse 3. Here we see the Lord answers the king's prayers with blessings. For you met him with the blessings of good things. You set on his head a crown of gold. Um, I said met. It should be meet. For you meet him. The word meet here to meet someone is kadam. It means to come before or to meet. It's kind of an awkward way to say it. And you'll see translations do something different with it. But the idea is the Lord meets the king with good blessings. Um, these blessings being good, they're good for him, which in turn would be good for the country, for the people, for the nation of Israel. They're quality blessings. The prayer that is answered is just right. These good blessings can also be reward for the king's faithful service to God and his people. That was the way the Mosaic Covenant worked. It's something you always want to keep in mind when you study the Old Testament. Once it comes after Moses, the people are always under the covenant. 
which involved the blessings and the curses. Up to the time of Christ, they were under the Mosaic Covenant. Some of the blessings that we're going to see come to the king, given in this psalm, is a long life, great honor and majesty, happiness as a ruler, gladness in the Lord's presence. All of these are treasured blessings for any ruler. In fact, any person. We want a good, long life. We like the fact that we know we're meeting God's approval and we're happy in what we do and we're glad when we're in His presence. The last line says, you set on his head a crown of gold. Now, obviously, this is figurative. Um, the Lord didn't come down and just put a crown of gold uh, on his head, so it's figurative. In a sense, this means the people have recognized the person who announces this. They acknowledge that the king has met with divine approval. He's doing excellent as a king. The Lord himself recognizes the king as doing well, and the people acknowledge the king's divine approval. In verse 4, the king receives extended life and reign as a blessing. He asked of life, you gave it to him, length of days, forever and ever. Well, the question arises of when did the king ask for life, for longer life? Well, we don't have that in this psalm. But any king who has to regularly battle or send people off to war, he has both external threats and internal threats. So we would assume he's being threatened or he would be threatened. Life, death situations, going out in the field. Uh, we would expect him to pray for protection his own protection, and that he would have a long and prosperous reign that would glorify the Lord. Now that's something you can pray for. You probably won't be praying for going into battle, but you certainly can be praying for your service to the Lord, your ministry to the Lord, that it'll be uh, effective, that it'll be uh, helping build up the church as we're to do. Here we see the king's prayer is being answered. He's been delivered in battle. And it also includes this last, the second line here, length of days forever and ever. This would mean a long life in this context. Uh, you hear the phrase, long live the king. Uh, this is what's going on with this king. He's having a successful, long reign. doesn't mean eternal life here. That actually is not something that was taught in Israel too much later. In fact, it was about the time of the exile. So these two lines refer to the king praying for his long life, for his own life, which would be an extended, ex successful reign as well as the king of Israel. So when he prays for a long life and it's answered, it's answered not only in his personal life being lengthened, but granting him a long and successful reign. Verse 5. God receives the glory from the king's success. 21.5. His glory is great through your deliverance. Splendor and majesty you bestow upon him. This tells us that the king receives greater glory or honor through the Lord when the Lord grants deliverance or salvation through battle. It's something we should always know that when God does something through us, we may get some recognition, we may get some honor, and the Lord may even in a sense, grant us glory. 
That's just kind of a term for honor that we would use today. But most of that's going to come in the future for us. The reason this is obvious is because we're not a king. We're not set up today to receive glory and honor as a king would from his people. You may get some admiration from your family or maybe your spouse or close people, loved ones, friends, and so on. But we're talking about real glory and majesty, recognition of the highest kind on earth. Let's talk about the word splendor, kind of a strange word for what we have it meaning. Hod, hod, uh, it means splendor or majesty. And then a word that's almost synonymous, hadar, hadar. It means honor and can mean splendor. So you're basically saying the Lord bestows splendor and majesty or honor. These are terms that are always, uh, I misunderstand here, but they're, uh, all, it can always refer to God, but not every occasion does it refer to God. In other words, God always has the splendor and the honor and the majesty. Sometimes we see it used towards person. Uh, with God, Psalm 96, 6, 104, 1, 111, 3, to name some of the places. So, the Lord gave this splendor and majesty to his kingly leaders as they received victory in battle. This amounts to the king reflecting the glory of God in his life and reign. So that the God of Israel, or the Lord, would work through the king. And the king would have victory. And then he would receive honor majesty and splendor and this in turn because his position as the mediator between the people representing God to the people representing the people of God he'd receive glory from them and this in turn meant God gets the glory of course God directly gets the glory also but it also brought uh, confidence encouragement pride, you might say, rightful pride in the people's king because he's following the Lord. Now, when this king had a victory in battle, you just imagine defeating a horrible, threatening, dangerous enemy. The king would get glory because he had the right strategy. He employed the right tactics. He did everything a field commander would do properly, and made the right decisions for his own commanders, and they in turn did what he was, did what they were told and bring victory to the people. Now, this was a frequent thing in the life of Israel, going to war, going to battle. There was constantly kingdoms around them that would like to have what Israel had. That's the way it was in that day. A little different today. The kingdoms seem to be much bigger, much more powerful, much more destructive. But uh, this is the way it was in that day regarding the people of Israel in relation to their king and the king to God. We should also see that because the king of Israel represents God to the people, when he was victorious through relying on God, then what we have is the king reflecting the glory of God. When he's victorious in battle, he reflects the glory of God and what God has accomplished through him. That is also true of us today. When we live our lives, when we do the works or speak the words of God in his power, we can reflect his glory in our works. 
He knows what we're doing. We may not get the honor as a king, as I mentioned earlier, but that is something that is in the future that awaits us in eternity. When the Lord provides for us, He delivers, He makes something happen for us, when we do His will, even though it's a tough situation, we may not see the glory that a king might have gotten in ancient Israel, but that is future reward. Paul was very well of that. There's a couple of well-known scriptures in that. One's in Romans, another one's here in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4.17 for a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. When we are victorious, that is when we have spiritual victories in our trust in God in a difficult situation, He will glorify us in eternity. Almost every week, sometimes more than every week, something big happens in my life, in my family, with myself, with my wife, something that goes on. Sometimes it's a, uh, a challenge of some sort. It might be a health issue that comes up, a financial issue. Um, something else comes up about a family member that we have to deal with. It's a big deal. It's a regular thing. That's one thing about having a family. You often have a lot of things to deal with that are big. Uh, I mean, even on a human level, a, a child graduating from high school, a, a child uh, getting his driver's license, that's about to happen again to us in, in our family. It's a big thing. Uh, we, have to, we don't have to keep hauling him around all the time. A child gets his first really good job and that type of thing. These are all always big issues in a family because it, it changes your routine up. It changes your life a little bit. And we see God blessing us time and time again, trusting him in these situations he's going to get us through. This brings not only God glory, but brings something else we're going to see here in this psalm verse 6 there's still more talking about what the Lord does for the king again for you grant him blessings forever you make him rejoice with gladness in your presence the king here is a model before the people of doing what is right before God as he does so, the Lord gives him or makes him. Some will, actually, the word means makes, but the translation seems better if we leave it as give or grant. Gives him or grants him blessings that continue on and on. That's the idea behind forever. You're always being blessed, you see. The blessed life is a life of obedience to God. No matter what discouragement, you don't let yourself be discouraged by difficult circumstances, uh, your own bad decisions or indecisions or someone else's, or uh, not encouraging words from people, sometimes just the opposite. The blessed life is a life of obedience to God. This says about the king, you make him rejoice with gladness in your presence. This is referring to a person or perhaps the congregation in this psalm talking to the Lord. You make him rejoice. Him is the king. Lord, you make him rejoice with gladness in your presence. When he's in your presence, what does that mean? His time in the tabernacle, his time in close fellowship with the Lord. It is through the Lord himself who comes out and blesses the king. That's the picture here we have in mind. There's a sense of the God's presence when there is victory 
when you're relying upon God. You know it was Him. You could not have done it on your own. And we praise Him for it. And the people here are acknowledging the kings rejoicing over the Lord blessing him. And I must say, I can only imagine, at least in this life right now on earth, this ever being a reality that we have a very godly ruler. In the United States, it would be a, a president, a, a, perhaps a majority of congressmen, I'd settle for that, and, and, and state rulers. Uh, it's almost always a small minority. Occasionally we get a Christian, but he's usually not strong in other positions. And sometimes they do more damage and if they had not done anything. But that's another issue. Verse 7 is that transition verse. Remember with the first six verses it was what God had done for the king. Verse 7 tells us what is going on in the present. For the king trust in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Boy, this is a word. This is a, this is a verse we can really apply right now. Let's look at it closely. We see the exchange between the King and the Lord. First, we see that the King trusts in the Lord. This is an ongoing, present, active thing. Uh, the participle here, the trust, the word for trust is in the part as a participle showing continued trust of the king and the Lord. The exchange that takes place as the king continues to trust. Let me go ahead and just outline this for us. <clears throat> so as the king trust the Lord all right the Lord in turn uses it this way the Lord operates under the principle of loving kindness loving kindness let me talk to you about that it has a lot to do with the word grace. The word is actually, here I can put it up there, kessid. I've actually seen that a lot. God's goodness and kindness towards man. It can mean loyalty. It's a term that you see in the covenant exchange between man and God. So God deals with man who trusts in him with loving kindness. And that can mean great blessings in all kinds of ways. So that's the exchange that's going on. The king trusts in the Lord. The Lord operates towards the king in loving kindness. The title here we see for the Lord in this particular verse is Most High. Let's look at the verse again. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High, he, referring to the king, will not be shaken. The word for Most High is El Yom. El Yom. It's a title for the God of the universe, of all creation. Let me give you some places where it's used. Genesis 14, 19. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. He's the creator. Psalm 83, 18. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the Most High over the earth. In other words, he runs the earth. He runs everything. He keeps everything going. Psalm 47 2. For the Lord Most High is to be feared 
a great king over all the earth. He's the king of the universe. So, the next result we see in our verse after this exchange, the last part, let me just read the second line. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. One of the blessings that come out of trusting the Lord is when the Lord comes back with his loving kindness, it pre presents stability in the life of the king. You know, it's one thing that I like in my life, and that's stability. Uh, part of that is routine. I get so much done when I can stay in routine. All too often something happens, as I just mentioned, that takes me out of routine and, and wants me to get back to that because I believe that's where I'm most productive in the ministry. Probably not most productive in my own personal spiritual growth, but that is where I can keep my routine going to accomplish what I want to get done for that day or that week. So, let's talk about the word shaken. The word is mot, M-O-T, pretty simple. It means to totter or shake or slip or move. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High. Now, keep in mind the title they use here. In fact, let me do that right here the loving kindness of the most high the king of the universe through his loving kindness he presents stability steadfastness uh, the king's not going to slip he's going to do the right thing he is stable he is strengthened so as not to be moved by whatever or whoever comes at him. He's stable as a ruler. His reign is unshaken. There's a lesson here for all of us. As we continue to trust in the Lord, all right, we trust in the Lord. He, from his loving kindness, grants us what we need to remain stable, unmoving, steadfast for him. As I mentioned earlier, these are covenant terms. Uh, such terms as uh, loving kindness, trust, these go back and forth between a believer and his God. That reflects a covenant relationship. We're under the new covenant based on the blood of Jesus Christ, the work of Christ. For the psalmist here and these people who proclaim this in their day, they were under the old covenant. But the same principle held, you trust the Lord. The Lord will in turn bless you in many different ways. We don't see it as a holy nation. Uh, we don't see it like the people of Israel would, but we see it as new covenant people. God blesses us with heavenly blessings. Many of those will be in heaven, but at the same time, we get our share here on earth, where God blesses us with many opportunities to bring glory to him. Verses 8 through 14 talk about future things and the king. Again, let me remind you, though the psalmist wrote it for a special time for the king, a ceremony or celebration, but a prophet or priest will address the king, pronouncing the future blessings that will come to him. Listen to verse 8. Your king, actually, let me say it again, your hand, referring to the king's hand, will find out all your enemies. 
your right hand will find out those who hate you. Well, this obviously has to do with more battle, but not just battle. It can be internal uh, problems within the kingdom also. The repetition of the word hand here, said in a couple different ways, strengthens the point. Uh, the picture of uh, finding has the idea of grabbing hold of one's enemies. In battle, the king searches out and destroys his enemies. His army will find those who oppose him and God's people. Domestically, or internal enemies will become known so they too can be properly dealt with. If there's anything we've seen in our current president is the constant internal and external enemies always going on. Not only enemies of his within this country and enemies may be too strong, certainly opposition, but there's enemies too as the constant internal warfare that goes on. I'm not talking about just as administration. I'm talking about government as a whole. It constantly goes on. Uh, that's one reason we need to pray for our leaders and pray for our, our president, uh, wherever you live, that you'll have good, stable leadership, that they'll become Christians. What a wonderful thing, like I said, for several of our leaders to become Christians. Domestic or internal enemies will become known so they can be properly dealt with. That's what this is telling us also. Uh, they'll surface. They'll mess up. They'll be exposed. They'll be caught. And that will bring a better rule for the king. That's what's going on here. Verse 9 speaks to the destruction of the enemies. This is strong stuff, so hold on. Speaking to the king again, you will make them as a fiery furnace at the time of your appearance. Now, here we're getting a blending of the king and the Lord acting. The Lord in his wrath will devour them, and fire will consume them. You know, fire was a big weapon in the ancient world. It still is today. Um, fire was used to destroy cities and fortresses, defenses. It frightens people. It causes them to flee. It destroys crops and defeats enemies. So, this is a literal interpretation regarding the fire, but figurative when it comes to actually the fiery furnace. Um, of course, a fiery furnace, we can picture that in our mind. We think perhaps Daniel's three friends uh, being uh, led into that, forced into that, surviving beautifully. But a fiery furnace is basically when there's fire all around. Um, there's no way out. That's the figure here. The enemies are trapped for destruction. When the king shows up, the orders are given to destroy the enemy, as if they are in a fiery furnace. And then it speaks of the Lord. The Lord in his wrath will devour them, and fire will consume them. Here we see the word, or rather the Lord, also working through the fire to destroy the enemies. Together, we see the enemy are destroyed. They are devoured. They are consumed by fire. It goes further, verse 10. You destroy their offspring from the earth and their dependents from the sons of men, that is, the human race. Now, what this is doing is this is another parallel verse. It said, basically, it says the same thing in a couple different ways. This says that the men, women, and children will be destroyed. So complete that there are no descendants left. Now I'm aware that some of us may be squeamish about this. And uh, it's really never bothered me once I understood a couple of principles. Uh, 
we need to remember that the Lord wants his people to be uncontaminated by idols and evil. And sometimes the only way to do that is to do away with the entire people. And that means men, women, and children. It's an instilled culture that can only be rid of by total annihilation. God wants his people holy. And if that meant wiping out an enemy, their entire culture, then that was the thing to do. You know, sometimes when there is a disease, the only thing you can do is, is cut it out or kill it. That's one way to look at it. But these are also God's creatures. Uh, it calls them the offspring from the earth, dependents from the son of man, from the human race. But remember the flood. Remember the destruction at Armageddon. I should say, uh, remember that's going to happen when the Lord himself comes back and slaughters millions. The destruction of the heavens and the earth. The destruction of those at the Gog and Magog re rebellion. Not to mention, in fact I will mention some, the many times God gave orders to destroy everybody in the Old Testament. There were times the military commanders of Israel were to destroy men, women, and children. In Deuteronomy, Moses is speaking, recalling what's happened. Deuteronomy 2.34, At that time we took all his towns and completely destroyed them, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Deuteronomy 3.6, We completely destroyed them, as we had done with Shehon, son of Heshbon, destroying every city, men, women, and children. Under the principle of, uh, let me just put this whole line up here. Karem, it means ban or destruction. I don't think I have room here. Under the principle of haram, it basically means to ban, to devote to destruction. Everything can be destroyed except the gold and silver and other vessels, and they would be kept for sacred purposes. They probably put them through a ritualistic cleansing, and they could be used for um, sacred purposes. The verb for karam means to ban or devote or exterminate. I'll spend a couple minutes on this to help us grasp the extent to which this destruction would take place. Joshua 6 7, the ban calls for everything to be killed, destroyed, or dedicated to God. Now, this wasn't always applied across the board consistently, however. You know the story of Jericho. Did you pay attention to this verse, verse 24? Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. The only thing they were told not to touch that was Rahab and everybody in her, in her place. Even during the time of the monarchy, the time in which these psalms were written for, 1 Samuel 15, 1. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over the, his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So the Lord called for total destruction at times, 
that was the way to stop the people. A way to stop the people from spreading their evil influence. Okay, back to our verse again. 21.10, let me read it again. You destroy their offspring from the earth and the descendants from the sons of man, referring to the human race. The offspring of the earth are their human descendants, as are the descendants from the sons of man. So these terms are repeated for emphasis. Basically the same thing is said in these two lines. Even the offspring of the enemy are destroyed. Now, from another angle, we can look at this from the cursing and blessing section of the Mosaic Covenant. When the people of Israel were obedient, listen to Leviticus 26, 7 and 8. But you will chase your enemies and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. The point is, they'll be victorious. On the other side of this, when the armies of the world were out to destroy a, a obedient Israel, they would fall under that Abrahamic covenant curse. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what would happen is, when they came after an obedient uh, nation of Israel, they would in turn be cursed. Isaiah 14.22 I will rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will cut off from Babylon her name and survivors, her offspring and descendants, declares the Lord. Back to our psalm, verse 11. Though they planned evil against you, they devised the scheme, they will not succeed. Again, it's being said of what they did towards the king. The enemies of the king, whether foreign or domestic, plotted and schemed for his defeat. But they will not succeed at it. The Lord will keep the king in place as long as he so wills. Nothing that even the most powerful, cleverest, threatening army can do will change that. Time for some application. God will keep you where you are as long as it is his will. He will sustain you when you are attacked by those who oppose you. They will not succeed. But let me add this. If it is time for you to move out of there, you may get fired or laid off, asked to resign, then you assume that as long as you know you've been doing the right thing before the Lord, it's time to move on. You really cannot lose with the Lord on your side. Don't ever forget that. My sons come back to me sometimes reporting something that happened to them at school. Uh, or maybe work. And it is really unfair what happened. In fact, it's incredibly unfair. It, and most of it sounds like it was set up to be that bad. But sometimes they'll have a professor or, I don't know, a supervisor, someone who is so unfair towards them that it's a real test for them. I understand. I've been through those things myself. I still go through them now and then. But they need to remember, as we remind them, the Lord's still in charge. If the Lord put a bully in charge of you, or some sort of, we might even call him a tyrant, a, a woman or a man, that's a test for you. And there will come a time where they'll get what they deserve. You do what's right before the Lord. Verse 12. 
Now they're speaking to the king and his army. For you will make them turn a shoulder. That's an expression means to turn back. When you aim your bowstring, actually the, the figure is for the arrows, at their faces. Isn't that one interesting? The idea of making them turn a soldier is causing them to retreat or turn back. That is to turn a shoulder. Aiming your bowstring is a figure of speech for aiming arrows at their faces, right at them, so they can see what's coming at them, a kill shot. Verse 13, the congregation responds in praise and prayer. Rise up, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. This is confidence that the Lord will rise and do what needs to be done to the enemies of the king and Israel. The Lord is the source of strength and power, and that is such a root principle to understand how God works in our lives he is the source of our strength. He is the source of our power. It's up to Him. And when He does respond, and He will respond, and this is referring also to the future, we sing praises to Him. Let's read through our translation. Psalm 21. For the choir director, a psalm of David. O Lord, the king rejoices in your strength you give, and he rejoices greatly in your deliverance. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips, Selah. For you meet him with the blessings of good things. You set on his head a crown of gold. He asked life of you. You gave it to him, length of days, forever and ever. His glory is great through your deliverance, splendor and majesty you bestow upon him. For you grant him blessings forever. You make him rejoice with gladness in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery furnace at the time of your appearance. The Lord in his wrath will devour them, and fire will consume them. You destroy their offspring from the earth and their dependence from the sons of men. Though they planned evil against you, they devised a scheme, they will not succeed. For you will make them turn a shoulder. When you aim your bowstring at their faces, rise up, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, this has been another marvelous psalm that we can learn from, that we can apply in so many ways in our own lives. Lord, help us learn to trust in you constantly so that we might experience your loving kindness and blessing us and giving us spiritual victory after victory so that you in turn receive the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.